it's seven o'clock. So welcome uh, everyone to our first meeting for spring 2022. Um, and welcome. And um, I have an apology that there'll be no president's report, but uh, the president's kindly uh, taken a few minutes off from his uh, cruising through France uh, just to um, be with us for the uh, opening. Um, so the meeting will follow the normal <laughs> Uh, agenda. Um, we'll uh, have our guest speaker followed by a short break so uh, you can refresh yourselves. After the break we'll have um, someone from my help uh, answering all your questions if you've got any and um, oh, I've lost my notes. Uh, and then oh, that's all for the evening. We, as I say we will not be having a um, uh, President's report because the president's uh, too busy sunning himself over in France and uh, didn't prepare himself uh, for a meeting. <laughs> so, um, welcome. Uh, just a few things. Uh, uh, as been advised in the email you got, this has been recording. So, if you don't wish the, the World Wide Web to see you, uh, I suggest you turn your cameras off. And, uh, I also suggest you. Uh, Turn your microphone off if you're not speaking, um, so we don't hear. Yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, by the way, Peter, there's a big loud noise. Not him. Aircraft noise. Well, we're certainly getting quiet. some interference from somebody. I think we've gone quiet. We've gone quiet now. So I'd like to welcome our guest speaker tonight, Richard Keach. Uh, Richard uh, will speak on the electrification of your home. I'm presuming that's slightly different to the electrification I've got in my house. I've got light switches and power points, but he's probably talking a bit more about that. But Richard is an experienced engineer who completed a Master's in Environment at the University of Melbourne in 2011, majoring in energy efficiency, modelling and implementation. Richard's primary area of interest is energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies and their role in society's response to climate change. Richard will talk to us about the whys and wherefores of moving your energy sources forward to an electric home. So following um, Richard's uh, um, presentation, he will take questions at the end. So if you've got any questions during the presentation, um, type them into the chat. Uh, or if not, at the end of um, Richard's talk, just uh, use the uh, hand up, um, uh, uh, whatever, what's it called, reaction, and we'll pick you up there. So welcome, Richard, and over to you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, Rob and David and everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, Okay, why are we talking about electrification? Uh, so some context. Um, I used to work in IT, uh, but for the last 12 years or so, uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency have been my professional life. Until recently, I worked for NHA Consultants. Um, my freelance gig is uh, new energy thinking so that's most of what I do these days. Um, seven years ago I wrote the book called The Energy Freedom Home um, which kind of outlines how to upgrade houses and make them efficient um, uh, and I'm the senior moderator of the Facebook group called My Efficient Electric Home so I just checked before this um, before coming online, we've got about 72,000 people on there. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it's quite an active forum for discussing these things. So, um, so why electrify? Um, of course, when I say electrify, I mean um, running your house with electricity as its energy source, not using gas. So the short answer is, uh, well, methane has problems. It's not low emissions, uh, its emissions are worsening. Um, there's a looming shortage of affordable gas um, and continued use uh, leads to the proliferation of coal seam gas, which is problematic. It's uh, not 
uh, as safe as electricity. Um, electricity, on the other hand, is getting cleaner um, and electrification lets us get cheaper energy and there are bonus benefits. Now, there's a whole heap of different things to talk about there, but in this talk, I'm going to focus briefly on why gas isn't low emissions because um, we've, if like me, you grew up thinking that it was, then um, you might be confused by that statement. Uh, and we'll talk about some bonus benefits that come with electrification and my own experience and, and some modeling about costs of, um, of electrification. So um, a little bit about the emissions. I'm, this is not a climate change talk, but I, I need to give this as, as background. So you'd be aware of this notion of a global warming potential as a scaling factor applied to emissions uh, when reckoning their impact when they're released. So um, when we're talking about methane, which is of course what's in natural gas, so-called, um, uh, th there are different time horizons for reckoning its impact um, over uh, 100 years or over 20 years. And, and uh, until uh, recently, you know, people tended to use this, the, um, the fourth assessment report numbers. So, so 25 is, is commonly cited as the um, how many times worse than CO2 methane is. But um, the problem is using the 100 year time horizon is completely arbitrary and it makes much more sense to apply a time horizon that lines up with the, uh, the time frame we've got to, to deal with climate change. Uh, and we should be using more recent data. So instead of using 25, we should be using 83. So in other words, the impact of leaking methane is worse much worse than people think. Um, so ideal, um, ideally methane emissions come from a source, they go through production, processing, transmission, distribution to an end use device, they bur it burns in air and you get CO2 and, uh, and water. Um, so that, that's the, the theory, but in a, in a real world situation, you've got a source of methane along with other things and through production, um, there's leakage, processing, transmission, distribution, there's leakage all the way along. And we're not just combusting it in, uh, in oxygen, we're combusting it in air, which is mostly, mostly nitrogen. So, you know, as well as carbon dioxide and, and water vapor, we're getting carbon monoxide, unburned methane, and nitrous oxides. Um, so um, it, it's not the simple water, uh, CO2 plus water vapor that, uh, many people think of. Um, and, and the scaling of the emissions, uh, of meaning leaking uh, methane before it gets to the point of use. Um, and this is just to make a point uh, that uh, in, uh, in, in the industry, there, there's assumptions about how much leaking happens before it gets to the end use appliance. And they're gravely underestimated, uh, in my opinion. Um, and this is based upon Melbourne University uh, data from about seven years ago. So the net result of using the wrong global warming potential number plus ex excess methane uh, leakage means that um, the, the fuel that we all thought for a very long time was, was clean uh, is actually not clean at all. Um, so, um, okay, with that behind us, um, understanding that gas is, is worse than people think, um, and you know, we've got good reasons for it, wanting to get off it. Let's talk about my, 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 my journey in, in electrifying. Um, this until recently was my house in, in Essendon, here in Melbourne. And over the course of um, about seven years, I turned it from a fairly conventional gas plus electric house into an all electric house. So 2006 was the last year before I made significant changes. And um, this shows the, uh, the energy consumption. So in this gas is the, uh, the red bits 
um, each bar is a month and um, electricity is the blue bit. So you can see how um, we're using a lot more elect uh, a lot more energy in the middle of the year. Uh, we've got a heating dominated climate. So we're using, uh, you know, there's a big seasonal effect on, on our energy consumption. So um, from, from me, starting at about 2007, I, I, I made various changes to the house. Um, and as you can see, the total uh, area under the curve, if you like, is coming down. Um, until uh, in October 2011, I disconnect from gas. Uh, then heating only with electricity. Um, 2012's electricity has gone up relative to 2011, but overall the uh, energy consumption is coming down. And so, uh, and, and, and there it remained. Uh, so the net result there is around about 75% reduction in overall energy use for the same occupancy uh, and uh, so it's pretty pretty controlled experiment. So, uh, and this is not including the effect of solar on the roof. This is just the underlying consumption of the house. Um, and there was no real compromises involved. In fact, the house was more comfortable at the end uh, than at the beginning. So this shows it can be done. I've done it. So, um, so there's some bonus that comes with not using gas. And, and I express that in, in this idea that wires beat pipes. So gas is an energy source. You know, uh, it's combustion uh, you know, gives us heat plus products of combustion. You know, it's, it's really a one trick pony. Um, whereas electronics and wires are a solid state technology. There's no products of combustion at the point of use. Uh, it's intrinsically simpler, more reliable and safe than combustion and pipes. Um, and as an example, think of the earth leakage circuit breaker, you know, the so-called safety switch in your, in your switchboard. Um, that, that's a really elegant example of uh, uh, electricity switching electricity. Um, it's taking advantage of the balance current in and out. Um, and, and there's no real direct comparison with, um, with gas. Um, and so we get something that would be very difficult to achieve an analogous gas thing. Um, electricity is so fundamentally versatile it can be in that it can be used to carry uh, energy and information and, and it can directly transform uh, to light and sound and heat and motion and stored energy and a lot of those transforms are reversible uh, and we can generate at home from the sun. Um, uh, all up electricity is obviously a better fit with digital tech than gas. Uh, there are smart features, it's easier to meter, um, and it scales really, really well, um, unlike gas. So, you know, from a pacemaker to a PV panel to a pumped hydro plant, you know, there's enormous range of scale across which we're used to electricity working for us. Um, next thing I want to um, talk about is this notion of high grade versus low grade energy. Um, high grade energy is energy that is capable of giving very, very high temperature differences. So for example, a gas flame about 1900 degrees, electric furnace 1800 degrees, they're examples of high grade energy. Uh, low grade energy, obviously low temperature differences. So home space heating, you know, we need 25 Celsius, domestic hot water 40 to 60 Celsius. So the, the key, takeaway message should be that we don't really need a high grade energy source when a low grade heat source would suffice. Um, so why start with something capable of giving us 1900 degrees when you only need 25? Uh, it's a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, so imagine it, if instead we had an abundant free low grade heat energy source. Well, we do, uh, there's heat energy literally, this, this is not a metaphor. There is heat energy around us all the time in air and water. Uh, as a re, you know, There's a reservoir of renewable ambient heat all around us all the time. So to understand this, it's useful to distinguish 
heat on the one hand from temperature on the other hand. Um, so there's low grade heat in the environment all around us. Uh, it's effectively infinite and renewable. So, um, and, and for the purposes of this discussion, it's useful to think of it energy like a fluid. It moves from one place to another. It naturally flows down the, the metaphorical hill, uh, in this case, from hot to cold. Um, and like water uh, can be pumped up a hill, uh, we, can, we can move heat energy from cold to hot. Um, and that's the role of a heat pump. Um, so it, it takes a little bit of electricity to move a lot of heat. Uh, and you don't need your main energy supply to be your actual source of heat. You can actually just use the mains electricity to activate the heat in the environment around us, uh, or at least when low grade heat is what we need. Um, another perspective on this is what I call the tale of three grids. Uh, it, we, we, uh, we might be oblivious to it, but in reality, our everyday lives involve the use of three parallel energy grids for electricity, gas, and petrol. Um, it, we can think of each of these as little compartmentalized silos of energy. Um, but increasingly, uh, using electricity makes gas and petrol increasingly redundant as an energy source. So uh, that can avoid the social, the societal cost of gas and petrol uh, and make zero carbon an economic proposition. So we, uh, in, in that sort of world, we only have to deal with a single grid, a daily service charge, one grid, one energy account. Um, so that, that brings the focus onto the electricity grid. Um, so we're used to thinking of the electricity grid as strictly a supply system. Uh, where uh, the role of the customers is just to consume. But increasingly, the electricity grid, um, in a world where people are generating their own electricity, uh, is that the grid becomes a sharing system. So that, that, that switching of fundamental role from a supply system to an energy system is, is really uh, quite fundamental. So customers produce and consume. And there's some, there's some diversification magic that can happen. Um, can electricity grid cope with more different uses? Well, it, it displaces gas, it displaces petrol, um, but there's diversity in the pattern and timing of the energy use. Um, so overall, there's better underlying utilization of the asset um, and smart management technology can, can keep uh, within the operating limits. So, um, so what that means is that uh, even though we may need more energy through the electricity grid, we don't need the, the, the capacity of the grid, the size of the pipe, if you will, to, be, to go up as much as, as you think. We, we're going to have to grow the grid a bit, but not by as much as people think. And that's because we'll, we'll have a, a, an underlying um, grid that's uh, better utilized. So in other words, we end up with diversified load, diversified generation and common energy transport to, to uh, end up with uh, in, in a much better place. Um, so if, an example of that diversification is uh, electric vehicle charging loads have a different peak uh, from normal uh, electronic peak. Um, is it economic? Um, well, as an example of how electrification can be economic, I, I want to show you this chart. Um, this type of chart, if, if there are any engineers among you, you'll recognize this as what's called a Sankey diagram. And um, flows are represented as the size of the line coming from the left and going to the right. So I just wanted to use this to illustrate a scenario where we want to get 10 megajoules of usefully delivered heat. And so this is a space, a, a, a domestic space heating scenario where uh, through a gas ducted system, conventional, uh, the sort that you see all the time in Victoria, 
a gas ducted system. We need a little bit of electricity to drive the fan and controls, but most of the energy is coming uh, in the blue from the left as gas from the burner. So to get our use to deliver 10 megajoules, we need about uh, 33 megajoules of, of gas. And contrast that on the other hand with um, a heat pump arrangement. Um, this is a split system, no ducts, uh, but a conventional split system. Uh, and we're asking of that system to deliver the same amount of usefully delivered heat. Most of that heat is going to come from the ambient air, um, and that's enabled by about two megajoules of electricity to drive the heat pump and the bit for the fan. So um, in that comparison, the blue on the right-hand side is compared with the blue on the left-hand side as a ratio of the difference in performance. So even uh, to the question, is it economic? We've got a 13 to approximately in this example, um, using the assumptions un underlying this, which I think are conservative. Um, we've got about a 13 to one improvement. So even if you allow that per megajoule, uh, gas is half the cost of electricity, the right-hand side is still much, much cheaper. So, um, so I want to finish up by talking about a case study um, uh, that I did for uh, the developers at the Cape development. Um, so the, the Cape is a residential development at Cape Patterson um, in um, South Gippsland. And this is the township and the development. Um, and um, that house in the middle is my house, my new house. That's that house there. Um, so this is where I live now. Um, I'm not there right now. I, I have a place in the city as well. But um, I've applied what I know to build this house and I've also done consulting work for the developers in understanding the quantity of the savings associated with, with uh, going all electric. This entire estate is all electric, uh, no gas to the estate. And uh, yeah, so the analysis for the Cape, we uh, assess, the goal was to assess the cost and emissions of the impact of going all electric. We're looking at uh, houses such as those at the Cape development, uh, plus a car. So the scope was to look at the operating costs and emissions uh, of, of fuel, gas, and electric. And, and the scenarios I looked at were uh, you know, comparing with a baseline scenario of a, of a house with uh, six star energy rating, no solar, no battery, um, uh, uh, common standard practice, uh, and then comparing that with uh, uh, a, ha a house with eight stars, uh, solar on the roof, uh, uh, a battery, and an EV. So they're the common assumptions that are apply in both cases. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's the assumed mode of transport in the examples. And the, the, these were the results that, uh, that came out. So uh, gas has gone entirely as, as a cost. Uh, electricity bills come down a bit, even though um, it's in, included in that electricity bill is the cost of charging the car and all the heating. Um, car expenses, the, the ones I've allowed for there are just the annual servicing. Um, and so the total energy cost uh, for the house and the car is reduced by about $5,000. It's about an 82% reduction in, in energy cost. Um, so that, that's quite significant. So takeaway message, going the whole hog um, here is $5,000 a year. Uh, and this is broadly in line with the um, estimates from Sol Griffiths, some of you may have heard uh, a fellow named Sol Griffiths wrote a book called The Big Switch, 
uh, who's also spruiking elect electrification. Um, so it's it's uh, corroborating uh, what he's done that you know, we came up with similar numbers. So this supports the feasibility of affordable broad scale electrification of residences. Um, the potential savings exceeded our expectations. Um, and in the scope of the development at the Cape, uh, which is about 230 homes when it's finished, uh, the residents of that estate um, are going to be saving about $1.1 million a year compared to what would be the case if they were a conventional um, situation. So that's, that's a lot of money to keep in the country uh, and keep it within a community every year. Um, I also wrote about this on the fifth estate um, and, and that's it. So what's that taken? 25 minutes. So we've got plenty of time for questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. There's a couple of questions. Um, they're starting. Um, what are the costs to install split system slash heat pumps and what is the current requirement that is size of cable, CBs, etc.? Well, um, the approach to using split systems and, and heat pumps I generally recommend splits as opposed to ducted uh, heat pumps. Um, my, in my own house, um, the, the, the first one I showed you, it, I used a uh, two, two multi-split arrangements. So we uh, heated the whole house with split systems, had seven indoor units, two outdoor units, so one outdoor unit was connected to three indoor units, the other to four. Um, and that whole installation cost about 12 grand uh, about 11 years ago. So, um, so yeah, um, the, you know, the, shifting a house from a conventional dual fuel approach and improving its efficiency uh, getting off gas is a journey. In my case, it took seven years. It cost, uh, I was a fairly early adopter of solar, so we put five, uh, just our solar cost, cost a lot more than someone today, but it still ended up paying for itself. Um, so yeah, there, there are costs, but ultimately the savings are considerable. So in, by the time I sold that house in Essendon, um, between 2007 and 2022, my avoided costs were about, uh, were over $60,000. So if I'd compared with, I would have spent $60,000 more on gas and electricity than I did. Um, so, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it's certainly an economic proposition. Steve, you've got a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, it took me a while to unmute. Um, yes, Richard, just interested in your thoughts on hot water. I can mm. think of three alternatives. Um, one is a reverse cycle hot water system. The other would be direct solar heated hot water. And the third, yeah. and maybe the best actually, solar panels just running a normal electric hot water system. Hmm. Have you have you looked at the economics of those three options or could you perhaps just give a gut feel if you haven't done the sums? Yeah, um, I did, um, I was the, the co-lead author of, the, of a report called the Zero Carbon Australia Buildings Plan which was released in 2013. And, and this is one, one thing we looked at um, and, and the results were interesting. So we went into it thinking solar hot water is the way to go. Um, and we came out of it thinking heat pumps were, were the way to go. And the reason why, there's a few reasons why solar hot water isn't as good um, 
One is that um, it takes it takes up well. It, it's a, it's a single purpose um, uh, use of that uh, heat. So, in other words, you're taking up that real estate on the roof just for heating hot water. Whereas, if you the same space on the roof used for solar PV, uh, that that energy is much more versatile. Um, the other point is. Uh, solar hot water can't use its surplus. So in a situation where the tank is already full of hot water, uh, but there's still solar on the, on the solar panel, then, then that surplus solar heat cannot be used. Um, in fact, it can be problematic. So you can have um, stagnation, so-called stagnation problem, where you end up uh, overheating the tank and dumping a whole lot of water that you don't want to lose. So. Um, the third problem with uh, solar hot water is that uh, the generation in winter is poor, so you've got to boost it with conventional uh, gas or electricity. So, so even if overall you're averaging across the course of a year equivalent to a heat pump, in winter the, uh, the, the peak demand of electricity is, is, is a lot higher. So. Um, so heat, heat pumps are generally better for that reason. But uh, Viv, I take your point that um, there's a lot to be said for uh, using surplus solar PV just to drive a conventional electric storage hot water service. And uh, yeah, I haven't specifically done the numbers on that. However, um, that's, that approach is usually done using what's called a solar diverter and, and install the solar diverter cost in the order of a thousand dollars. And so they're not cheap. And with the subsidies on heat pump hot water services, it's often cheaper, uh, the net out of pocket for a, for a, mid, a cheap to mid range hot, uh, heat pump hot water can be cheaper than, uh, than for a conventional electric hot water service with a diverter. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Thanks, Richard. Okay. JP, you've got a question on the chat. Plus, you've got your hand up. Yeah, the uh, question to Richard is: uh, you gave us a good comparison of the operating costs of the two forms of the Cape houses. Can you give us some indication of the comparable setup costs, implementation costs of the two scenarios, please? Yeah, good question, Dave. Um, thanks. Um, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but suffice to say, there's been a lot of work done at the Cape to make this affordable. Um, so the designs, there is at least 10 designs open source um, for affordable builds uh, at around about eight stars, seven and a half to eight stars. Um, so yeah, the the, uh, the methods are there to build high performance houses uh, without ridiculous expense, if you want to. Um, I'm a, you know, my house was a bit higher spec, so it cost more, but. Um, I'm aware of houses at the Cape that three or four years ago cost uh, in the order of uh, $300,000 to build, so, which uh, uh, is not unaffordable for most. No, that's comparable. It's, you know, it's, it's not low end volume builder cheap, but it's neither is it ridiculously expensive. I guess the key was what's the difference between the standard method and going the full blown EV method? It's obviously not 300,000. Um, it depends. I, I can share with you the assumptions in the modeling afterwards if you like, Dave. Um, but yeah, I don't know what, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Fine, okay. John 
Thanks. Uh, Richard, I was very impressed with the progressive improvement in your um, energy consumptions. Yeah. And uh, wondered if you could tell us what you had uh, done in addition to the technical things with the electricity and gas and so on to uh, improve the thermal efficiency of your house, such yeah. as uh, double glazing, roof insulation, etc. Yeah, um, good question. Thanks, John. Um, the the first big thing we did was upgrading um, insulation and and um, so yeah, lots of insulation. We insulated the, the actually the wall insulation came last because that was the hardest thing to do. But yeah, uh, extra insulation in the ceiling and under the floor. Um, we we fitted secondary glazing on the existing windows. So. Um, so secondary glazing is adding another glazing layer uh, on an existing window without throwing it away, um, and the results are good. Um, so you're giving you're getting double glazed performance with uh, at a much lower cost and without losing the visual appeal of of, of otherwise good windows. Um, what else? Um, uh, draft uh, lots of draft roofing. Insulation glazing, upgrading the lighting, uh, improved appliances, uh, induction cooktop, um, uh, new hot water. Um, so I initially had uh, my hot water was um, uh, a hybrid arrangement, uh, an experimental hybrid arrangement with uh, evacuated tubes connected to a heat pump. Um, which lasted 11 years, um, but eventually did fail. Uh, the heat pump needed replacing, and I ended up replacing that just with the conventional electric system. So at the end, at the end, the um, the hot water was just a conventional uh, solar thermal hot water service. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, heat, heat, uh, getting rid of gas and using heat pump was was big. Big thing, um, and you can see that point on the chart at uh, in late 2011, where where we disconnected from gas. Thank you. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, John. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the additional things I I found um, is ventilation, and in Australia, of course, particularly in the summer. Uh, we all like to throw open the windows and get the air through, um, but, but then it, the weather the weather gets very hot and it becomes impossible. Uh, and I wondered if you had, had adopted any special tricks in that area. Fresh air is fresh air is a wonderful thing. Yeah, not in this, not in the uh, Essendon period house. In my new place, um, which I can talk about if you like, um, it's a passive certified passive house. Well, hopefully soon to be certified. Um, and it has a heat recovery ventilation system, which um, uh, works very well. And yeah, it uses, uh, if people aren't familiar, heat recovery ventilation systems, uh, they're not heating or cooling systems, but they, they uh, provide active and continuous ventilation uh, without losing the, the heat or cools uh, in the outside air. Uh, oh, sorry, in the conditioned air. So um, in, a, in a winter scenario, um, the warm, stale inside air passes through a heat exchanger and pre-warms the incoming cold, fresh air coming yeah. from outside. Thank you. You've got another question. Yes, yes, Richard. I, my ears pricked up when you talked about wall insulation. Yeah. Um, I have a brick veneer house which was built in the 70s and there was no wall insulation in those days. And yeah. I've thought about insulating the walls, but it seems to me to be very difficult. So 
how did you go about it? Yeah, good question. Um, and, and just for context, my my main uh, work these days is is going into people's homes and helping them, helping assess them and 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 preparing a plan to upgrade them. Um, and what, what what I see is what I've learned in the, in that process of assessing many hundreds of houses in in, in Victoria is that. Um, Brick veneer houses with tiled roofs uh, are the most amenable to upgrading wall insulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said you had a brick veneer. Um, Tiled roof as well. Yeah, so the good thing about uh, brick, brick, the course of bricks on the outside of a brick veneer house are, are, are not what's holding the roof up. Um, the, the stud frame, um, the timber stud frame is the structural thing, and, um, and and between the stud frame and the course of bricks, there's generally a gap of uh, 30 to 80 millimeters um, or so. And um, generally, that that gap behind that course of bricks is accessible um, if you're pushing tiles out of the way. Yeah. Um, above the eaves, so you yeah. can access the top plate of the wall, and and a loose full in, in, uh, insulation material can be pumped into the walls from above uh, yeah. and fill up the walls. So, um, if if that vector, if you like, isn't available, then it's possible to to drill holes either on the inside or the outside. Uh, in the brick veneer scenario you may end up just needing to drill holes underneath windows. Um, and, you know, in the best case, uh, you, can, you can get access to everywhere else but under the windows by coming in through the tiles. Okay. I guess you would have to close off any gap at the bottom down at floor level. And, and the, other, the other extension to the question, what sort of loose fill? Yeah, um, to the first half of that question, um, yes, the the bottom plate of the wall will need to be inspected, um, but often it doesn't need to be closed up because the the, the material goes in and, and can bridge the small gap there okay. without without falling through. Mm -hmm. um, but if there are larger holes, then yes, they'll need to be filled. Um, the material used is usually a, a, uh, a treated glass fiber shredded material. So if you were to hold it in your hand, you would, feel, you, you would think it was shredded cotton, but it's actually uh, silicone treated uh, glass fiber. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's a loose material that's the, the, the pieces of it are small enough that it can be pumped pneumatically through a hose. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for that. And look, can I just ask one other, this is a very general question, maybe outside the scope of your area of expertise, but it seems to me that duplicating two energy networks is crazy. And I, I just wonder if anybody's ever worked out what the cost saving to the nation would be in, a, in abandoning the gas network because obviously that costs money to maintain and extend. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and yeah, getting off gas and, and, and you know, putting a sunset on, uh, well, the first thing is to, um, to stop expanding the gas network. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of, there's some useful precedents around the world. And the first Australian precedent has just happened in the ACT. The ACT government has just uh, earlier this year, I think, announced that uh, they're putting an end date on new gas connections in the ACT. Um, as for the total cost savings, um, yeah, they would be considerable, um, but I don't have a number. It would at least offset part of the cost of having to make improvements to the uh, to the grid. 
Yeah, the, the total cost borne by society will diminish because you're only maintaining one grid. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, yep. Thanks, Richard. You've got a question? Uh, yes. Uh, Richard, I, I just wondered, you, you actually had a, a timber home that you yeah. uh, that you improved the, uh, the whole thing on. Um, yeah. So that wasn't a brick veneer. Mm. And you said you insulated the walls. I'm very interested mm. as a, also a, of a timber home, slightly different, mm. but it's still a timber home. Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. Um, around that. Yeah, I, I said before that brick veneer is the, the, the case that mo is most amenable uh, to insulating the walls for, uh, in a retrofit situation, but it's not the only one. Um, you, where you've got a, a weatherboard house, um, you can, uh, well, to, uh, you've got a stud frame, the vertical elements, the studs, horizontal elements, the noggins. Yep. Um, so in, in every stud bay, if you like, um, the, you know, the space between two adjacent studs, if you've got two noggins, then there are three voids. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got to drill three holes. So in every stud, you know, like if, if the wall sections have two, two noggins in each stud bay, uh, you've got to drill three holes in every uh, at the distance of every stud. So you, it ends up with a lot of holes. But um, as you can see, my house doesn't look like it's got measles. It, 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 it did. Um, I, I can show you some photos, if you like, of when it was done. There was a lot of holes drilled in it, and they were filled with um, milled timber plugs and sanded and painted. And, and, and doing all that was a pain in the ass, um, but it was worth doing. And in a sense, that was the bigger, the last major change in, in that house. And I knew that I'd really hit, hit pay dirt when, uh, you know, that, that was done about April 2010, I think. Um, and then in the following winter, my daughter, you know, who, whose bedroom is the bedroom at the front there on the left um, one, one day in, uh, in, in that next winter she said hey dad I don't have to get dressed for school under the doona anymore what did you do <laughs> so uh, that that That's feedback from, from from my daughter was kind of central in me appreciating that that uh, that I had achieved the goal of making the house perform well thermally. Uh, did, and you end up, did you end up hanging up a lot of pictures, a lot of additional pictures? It sounds like oh. you did it from the outside. Oh, yeah, it was, oh. it was done from the outside. All um, oh, right, okay. Yeah, um, it could be done from outside. Uh, well, that house had an oven plaster in the old section, so you definitely don't want to drill and inject through lath and plaster because the la the plaster can delaminate from the lars and just come off in big sheets. Um, but if you've got plasterboard, you can go in through the plasterboard, but it can be messy. Um, so whether you go in from the inside or the outside really becomes a, an, an evaluation of what's the least worst situation. Um, and um, sometimes, for example, houses Older houses might be facing uh, recladding on the outside anyway. You might have uh, aging weatherboards, and and this might be enough to trigger uh, a, a full replacement of the weatherboards on the outside, and and that's actually going to give a better result because if a house can be have the weather all the all the uh, siding removed, um, you'll get a better result by opening up those studs, stud walls, and putting insulation bats in and then putting new new weatherboards on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's obviously difficult and expensive and time consuming to do. Um, and, and the retrofit injection of insulation is, is quite feasible. Um, we did it 
it worked. Um, we were happy with the results. Did a contractor do all that, uh, in, do that injection of the insulation, or mm. is that something you were able to do yourself? No, definitely not DIY. It, it needs specialist equipment. I think the, so. The stuff is blown in. Um, yeah, so very much. Roughly what size hole would you need? Uh, so the size of a 50 cent piece. Okay, so about... Uh, about 30, uh, 35 mil. Three centimetres, yeah, 30, yeah. 30 millimetres. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. Um, so oh, a, good way to th a good way to think about the, the impact is that the heat passing through the through the thermal thermal envelope of the house is akin to water passing through holes in a leaky bucket mm. and in much the same way as a bucket's still leaky so long as there are holes the house is still um, you know, not fixed so long as there are unresolved major pathways for uncontrolled heat flow so, you know, that's a long way of saying uh, each of the different improvements you make are worthwhile by themselves, but you won't get the full benefit of doing them until they're all done in the same way as you won't get the benefit of plugging individual holes in the bucket until you plug the last hole. Right. Uh, talking about that... Uh two things um did you use a stud finder or something to to find where the studs and the noggings were um, uh, i didn't do the the wall insulation so oh, no, so, was, uh, so I, that company does all that yes okay and they're easily able to find if i googled wall insulation yeah if the, there's really only one company in melbourne doing it um they're called EnviroFlex. Um, okay. So, so um, give them a call if you're interested. Yeah. And also with talking about holes in buckets and things, uh, did you also spend a lot of time patching up holes in gaps in the, you know, around the walls and wherever? And how did you? Sort yeah, of I, I did. Um, There's... No, we could talk a lot about draft roofing. Um, it, yes, it's, sure. a bit, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an art form to doing it. But um, just to make it quick, there's some uh, some quick tips. Uh, a really common um, source of draft that most the people never think of is behind architraves. Yes. So so architraves around windows are usually sealed at the sides and often not sealed at the top and the bottom. Um, and that allows air pathways into the wall cavity and the wall cavity is usually open into the ceiling and, and often to the subfloor. Um, so yeah, carefully get up on the ladder and have a look behind the window and, uh, and, and door architraves and, and you might be surprised. Mm. Um, uh, pipe penetrations under dishwashers and under other kitchen cabinets are the hardest to deal with. They're really, really problematic because often what, what's happened is that there are pipe penetrations um, that aren't properly sealed at the point the cabinetry is put in. So accessing the point of the pipe penetration is often not possible because the cabinets are in the way. Um, so some, you know, some, there are some drafts there that are almost impossible to get rid of. Mm. Um, exhaust fans are another big one. Um, easy to fix by replacing them with a fan with a built-in backdraft protection. Um, uh, downlights are a, a legacy ventilated downlights are a common problem. Uh, they contribute a lot to drafts. Uh, Doors, um, doors and windows are often poorly sealed. Um, doors in particular are often warped. You, you, you might not realise that often the door doesn't engage uh, 
uh, perfectly uh, in parallel relative to the door jam. Often um, the, the door will make contact with the door jam in the vicinity of the latch, and then the door will be slightly from the outside, uh, it'll be slightly convex. So you'll have a gap toward the top and the bottom of the door and that's really hard to fix because it's a tapered gap. And so if you go and stick a, a weather strip in there, it doesn't make up for the taper. So you need an, another solution. Uh, and the best product out there is a product called uh, Draft Dodgers from a company called EcoMaster. Mm -hmm. Draft Dodgers, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, Viv. We might take David King's first before you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I was interested in your replacement of your traditional gas heating uh, mm -hmm. with electricity. Now, uh, in older houses, we tend to have a whole lot of rooms, perhaps 10 or 12 or something. Now, and also we feed warmed air into all of those when we're using gas heating as a traditional sort of Melbourne heating it was up very popular years ago when gas was particularly cheap. So uh, how do you replace all of those uh, or how do you heat all of those rooms using reverse cycle heating? Um, economically, by it, economically. Yeah, yeah, by putting a split system head unit in all the main rooms and then Places like bathrooms, uh, you deal deal with differently. Um, so, like I said, in in the the house pictured, um, it's a uh, four bedroom family home. Um, we we put in seven uh, split system units, but um, you don't want the conventional approach to split systems is what I call single splits where every inside unit has a corresponding outside unit and together they work as a, as, as a single heat pump operation. Um, that, that approach, uh, doing single splits multiple times around the house ends up being problematic. Uh, not the least because of the aesthetic impact. You don't want the house to, to be plastered. As you can see in that, that photograph, uh, that, that uh, left-hand side of the house uh, there is, uh, you don't see any air conditioners hanging off there. Um, in my case, seven indoor units and two outdoor units. So, so we're taking advantage of using multi-split arrangements where uh, each outdoor unit serves multiple indoor units uh, in, in the main spaces of the house. So for us, it was quite practical. Um, uh, it's a little bit more expensive to install but there's less equipment involved because you've got fewer outside units. There's usually a small standby power associated with every outside unit. Uh, and there's more, uh, each outside unit has to have a se separate uh, power and an isolator switch. So, um, so there's, there's some simplest, some offsetting simplification that comes with multi splits in that the, the, uh, the piping is more difficult, but the wiring is simpler. Um, so yeah, I find it quite pra quite a practical outcome. Um, in my new house, for example, it's it's a high performance passive house. Um, the the entire three bedroom house is served by one two head multi split, and the total capacity of the multi split is five kilowatts. Um, so we've got a two and a half kilowatt. Now, and, and for people who know air conditioning, you'll know that two and a half kilowatts is about the smallest air conditioning unit you can get. Two to two and a half is about their, their thermal ratings. So, um, so our main living area, uh, uh, because it's a very high performance house, you know, we can get by with one two and a half kilowatt uh, air conditioning unit. Um, a normal house uh, in, in a large kitchen, living, dining area like that might have uh, have, a, have an eight kilowatt um, capacity uh, split system unit. So 
<laughs> yeah, it makes the point that in houses that are very efficient, you can get by with much smaller um, heating and cooling arrangements. And if you're stuck with a house that's not very efficient, you said you saved sixty thousand dollars over a certain period. I've forgotten what that was. What did it cost yeah. you this entire conversion? Um, it cost about fifty thousand, um, but most of that was the cost of the solar. Um, I, I put in five kilowatts of solar with the premium feed-in tariff uh, at a time when when doing five kilowatts was extremely expensive. Um, so, yeah. Um, so to do what I did then to do it now would cost much, much less. So instead of being 50, it might be 25. Or thirty thousand. So yeah, if you've got um, a conventional um, three-bedroom family home and you want to um, retrofit it over a number of years to to bring it up to a high standard uh, to be more efficient and all electric, it might cost somewhere in the order of you know, fifteen to thirty thousand um, dollars, depending on where you want to get to and where you're starting. Um, but it's going to be money well spent. So you tr you're trading off uh, upfront costs for improved comfort and much lower operating costs. Thanks, Richard. Um, Viv? Yeah, uh, look, my question probably um, parallels a bit with uh, David's question. Um, with our house with a room that is not a large room and a room that is not used many hours a week, um, I've concluded that it's better to just use a small direct electric fan heater, which costs you $20, rather than spend a few thousand dollars on a reverse cycle. There is a break even point. And mm -hmm. I found it was about, in, in this particular case, it was about the life expectancy of a reverse cycle unit or maybe even slightly better to go direct electric heating. Have, have you really explored this? And maybe that's something um, that the previous guy could think about as well, if, if your answer is a positive one. Yeah. Um, it's certainly the case that you can... Um, in. in the more efficient the house is in, in its thermal envelope, the more feasible it becomes to use a heating method that you'd previously not bother with, um, like a, a small resistive heater, just because you need so much less heat energy. Yep. So yeah, I, I'd agree with that general observation. Um, but on the other hand, uh, having a small electric in a world where you need cooling anyway you can think of the heating as coming for nothing yes that's true but i guess a room that's used for four hours a week uh, and if you only consider the winter months it takes many many years just think of the heating i take your point on cooling it takes mm. many many years to get your money back on a reverse cycle mm. yeah another tip with heating um is um well, a couple of points. You can cope with a lower set point um, if you um, supplement the, the space heating with targeted heating where you're sitting. So yes. a, a nice arrangement might be to have a small heated floor mat. Um, there's a company called um, Reduction Revolution that sell things like this where like if, if you're in a study situation where you're working at a desk um, and and your default arrangement might be to have uh, the, the room conditioned to uh, you know, 22 degrees, say, you might alternatively be able to condition the room only to 19 and then just have a small 
floor heat a, a mat at your feet. So because that that and, and they're in the order of seventy watts of power, mm. um, and that heat's delivered uh, where you need it, and and you, and that means less energy needed to drive the the space heating in the room. Yeah. So I guess if you're capable of sitting down doing a few calcs, you there are lots of alternatives, aren't there? Yeah. The, the other point I'd make about um, space conditioning um, is it's an insight I had of that, um, that people generally overestimate the importance of air temperature as the key performance indicator of thermal comfort. Um, thermal comforts are actually a function of a whole bunch of things related to the space we're in and the people in the space. So in terms of the space room, the main variables are obviously the air temperature, the humidity, the air velocity, and what's called the mean radiant temperature. So the temperature of all the surfaces around us. So in a situation of a, a winter scenario in an inefficient house, you might have a situation where the occupants are not comfortable unless the set point temperature is around about, say, 24, 25 degrees. Um, but, but what's happening there is that 24, 25 degrees air temperature is, is around about half the contribution uh, or, or an equivalent contribution to your thermal comfort as the mean radiant temperature of the walls. And in that example, because it's a winter scenario, uh, poorly insulated house, the mean, the, the surface temperature of the walls, floors and ceilings might only be say 15, 16 degrees. Um, if, if you insulate instead, you're not own, the, the, our first order sense of what the insulation does is reduce the, the thermal power necessary to achieve a given set point. So that, that's intuitively where we come at that. But what most people don't think of is that by insulating better in that winter scenario, the surface temperature of all the walls, floors and ceiling around us are going to be closer to that ambient desired temperature. And you can trade off the mean radiant temperature with the air temperature, mm -hmm. around about one for one. So every extra degree warmer that your walls, floors and ceilings are on average is one degree less you can tolerate the air temperature for the same level of thermal comfort. Mm. And I think that's a profound insight because it means that when, especially when, when I talk to a lot of people about hydronic heating and, and people say, well, oh, but hydronic heating you know, is such a, a much more effective and, and natural and, and comfortable way of heating. Well, the best form of thermal heating is a well-insulated thermal envelope because it's not those point sources of, of, of heat from radiant, radiant panels that, that matter the most. What matters the most is having nice, um, uh, well, uh, or have all those square meters of walls, floors, and ceilings around you at a, at a nice temperature. Um, and the other, there's a, there's a, there's another secondary benefit of doing that is, is that it reduces the tendency of the air to stratify. Um, because uh, if you've ever looked at thermal images of an inefficient house, um, especially if it's ducted heating coming in from the ceiling, you often find uh, stratification such that you know, you, the warm air is toward the ceiling. You get a, a distinct line and then cold air toward the floor. Um, and the tendency of the air to separate like that and stratify is increased when you've got that big temperature difference between the air temperature and the mean radiant temperature. So that's a long way of saying when you make the thermal envelope better, your air conditioner doesn't have to work nearly as hard to achieve the same results. Yep. 
which overcomes a big um, objection many people have to uh, heating and cooling or heating in particular with split systems is people say they experience it as blowy, uncomfortable heat. And often that's true, but it's, it's not the fault of the split system. It's, it, it's, a, it's a fact that the unit has to work hard to overcome the fundamental problems with the thermal envelope. Yep. Mm, okay. Yeah, thanks. That's all very interesting, Richard. Thanks very much. A lot, of, a lot to think about there. Insulation is obviously well worthwhile. Got a question, Lance? Uh, yes, uh, I'm interested in the Cape Patterson house you've got. Yeah. Uh, what uh, thermal mass do you have there? In the first question. The next one is, do you find that the uh, timber cladding on the outside it takes a lot of maintenance? Uh, well, uh, I'll answer the second question first. Um, the, uh, um, let me bring up some photos. Um, or is it see? timber cladding, I suppose? Um, it's timber cladding. Um, hang on, I'm just going to bring up some pictures. Um, So this is the cladding. Um, it's a reverse board and batten. Uh, it's um, un, unsealed, um, a rough cut. Um, so, uh, so there's no painting or standing to have to, to uh, redo. It'll gray off naturally in weather. So it's, it's like we're not trying to fight nature. Uh, we, we're just going to accept the weathering as as a natural consequence of of it being in the elements, and and accept that as part of the aesthetic. Um, and so, I forgot the first part of your question. Yes, the first part was uh, what thermal mass do you have there at um, at Cape Patterson? I see. Yeah. You, you, you talked about insulating the uh, the floor, but do you have any thermal mass in there? Uh, no, it's a lightweight structure, so um, it's it's proof that you can get uh, good thermal performance um, without needing uh, large thermal mass. Um, so um, yeah, in other words, insulation is more uh, thermal mass is uh, is important, um, but insulation is much more important. And and if you insulate really really well then thermal mass becomes much less important. Right. We're planning, we're building a house at the moment with five, R5 uh, five in the roof and 3.5 in the walls. Yeah. Would you say that's the normal recommendation? Uh, uh, hang on a sec. Um, to your question, this is my blog, uh, newenergythinking.com. Can, can people see that all right? Um, Yep. Yeah. Talking. Okay. Um, so there's a blog post back from 2018 about thermal mass. Um, so if you're interested, you might want to read that. Sorry, Lance, what was your question? Uh, yes. Uh, we're building a house at the moment with R5 in the ceiling and 3.5 in the walls. Is that uh, what you'd recommend now? Um, Generally, a bit more than that in the ceiling. So we've got um, R6 in the ceiling and R4 in the walls, R5 under, underneath. Um, that's a potentially a little over the top. Um, so the trouble you might have is with the walls, uh, in, a, in a normal stud frame, not, not, timber studs are generally 90 millimetres deep. Um, and in a 90 millimetre profile, the most you can get is 2.7 and generally 2.5. 2. The premium bats are about twice the price to go from 2.5 to 
So if you want to get 3.5, uh, you might be looking at using 140 millimeter stud frames. That's what we used um, in our in our place. And in a in a 140 mil stud frame, you can fit R4. Thanks, Richard. John Thompson. Yeah, Richard, um, you probably noticed the number of grey hairs that have been watching you tonight. Um, what's going to give us, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 20 years uh, would be an optimistic outlook for payback on some of these things. Talking in 30, 40 years, I think we'd start to lose interest. Uh, yeah. What's going to give us the best bang for our bucks in the short term? In a retrofit scenario? Yep. Uh, draft roofing um, is an easy, quick win. Um, but broadly, um, I'd, I'd say have, a, have an upgrade plan. Um, I do this professionally. Um, I'm available to do home assessments. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, that, that generally goes by having a good look at your house, discussing your goals, and then coming back with you with a, a report outlining a whole bunch of um, prioritised steps to upgrade the house to meet your goals. So, and, and those goals can bear in mind your, the time horizon that you have in mind. But uh, generally, um, draft proofing is number one because that has an immediate impact on your thermal comfort um, and, and leads to very quick results. Um, uh, and after draft roofing, uh, it generally depends upon the house, uh, depending upon what the dominant pathway for uncontrolled heat flow is. So again, using the bucket analogy, um, each of the holes is like, uh, each of the different pathways for uncontrolled heat flow is like the hole in the bucket. And it's not always obvious looking at a house whether the dominant pathway is the, the ceiling or the walls or the windows. Um, so the thing that's going to make the biggest difference is, is dealing with the, big, the thing that's the biggest you know, metaphorical hole in the bucket. Um, yeah. And... Uh, but the good news is that often you can achieve significant improvements without huge outlays. So I'll give you an example. The, um, the most common problem I see is that ceiling insulation is poorly done, um, either a combination of poor initial insulation plus uh, the impact of trades, uh, subsequent trades, the trashing the insulation of, of the bats. So uh, sealing insulation, well, it's true to say that the insulation performance of any insulated system is dominated by the worst performing bit. Yeah. So you, you apply that thinking to a sealing space and, and you, you come up with the fact that the, the net performance is severely degraded with quite small holes. So there's a rule of thumb in the industry that says that a 5% reduction in complete coverage leads to a 50% reduction in overall performance. Mm. And believe me, there are very few houses out there that have 95% or better coverage most houses that I see have um, uh, huge gaps in insulation um, and uh, th that might amount anywhere from 15 to 25% of the ceiling coverage. So the, the homeowner might think they've got R4 in the ceiling, but in fact, they've got next to no effective insulation because they've got 20% of the uh, bare plaster exposed into the ceiling space. And that might be around down lights, it might be around um, vent registers, uh, it might be for no good reason at all, apparently. Um, 
and yeah, it's it's quite surprising how badly insulation is, <laughs> and how how just a bit of TLC. So for people who are a little bit um, prepared to to get dirty up in the ceiling, um, and, and please don't do this unless you know you, you're prepared to take safety safety uh, seriously and if you're comfortable doing it um, but just often putting bats back into place where they should be um, and often it's a matter of simply um, removing old down lights legacy down lights and replacing them with new IC rated down lights so New downlights made in the last few years tend to be sealed units that are rated uh, with what, what's called IC rating. IC stands for insulation contact. It'll have a little symbol on it. Um, hang on. So where are we? this symbol here. So if you see if you see a downlight that has that symbol on it, um, it's often on the cable or on the on the housing, then it's safe to cover with insulation or to abut insulation up to the fitting. Now most electricians are very wary and and leave a huge space around. Uh, uh, electricians are taught that insulation must never come near a downlight. Uh, and, and for good reason, because legacy down lights uh, are a big safety hazard if insulation covers them. But new down lights, um, if, uh, only do this if, if you actually cite an IC rating label on a light fitting, even if it's, it's not enough that it be an LED. If it's an LED light fitting, it, it's not necessarily IC rated. But if it's IC rated, um, then yeah, you can bring the insulation right up to the light fitting, so there's no gap, and that that can make a huge difference. Oh, it's so, interesting. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Richard, we've just got one question on the chat um, from uh, Steph Lancaster. What material did you use for underfloor insulation? Uh, in the what the material. <laughs> look, Instead of answering that directly um, with respect to my new place, I'll, I'll show you the, um, the, the stuff that I uh, recommend um, is this stuff. Um, so this is a polyester, a recycled polyester insulation. Um, and it's, it's got two things important about it that are better than using glass fiber bats. Um, first thing is it comes in rolls, not bat lengths. Um, so having uh, the ability to, to run a single length of this batting material between joists under, under the floor means you don't have to deal with the, 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 the break from one bat to the next. Um, and the next thing is the fibers in the polyester can take staples reasonably well, whereas you, you really can't staple glass fiber um, bats. Um, the, the, bat, the staples are just tear through. So, so this stuff, uh, if you're insulating under a floor, uh, this stuff will go between the joists and it can be stapled into the sides of the joists and, um, and, and it's very effective. It's, it's not affected by water. Um, it dries out well, it re regains its loft. Uh, vermin don't like it. Um, so, um, yeah, um, that's the product I recommend. Thanks for that. Um, well, it's uh, 25 past eight. You've been going for an hour 20, Richard. You've done very well. You probably uh, feel like a break. I just uh, got to one question. Uh, the whole of Melbourne from um, Cranbourne to uh, Sunbury is watching tonight. 
they're all going to rush out and uh, completely renovate their homes like your estimate home. Will the power grid uh, sustain everyone going full electric tomorrow? Yeah, good question, Peter. Um, well, short answer, yes. Let, let's consider my scenario here where I... So at the end of my journey when I was all electric, um, I reduced my total energy use by three quarters, um, but I'm not using any more electricity than I was at the start. So um, because of the efficiencies involved and improving the house and having a much more efficient uh, form of heating and cooling, yeah, it's, it's quite feasible to, to use not much more energy than before. Thanks for that. Well, if there's no further questions, um, I'll uh, like to thank Richard. I think um, by the questions that you've been asked and everyone's interest, um, they'll all be rushing down to Cape Patterson on the weekend, although I don't think it's going to be the best of weekends, um, to have a look at uh, your place. Now, Tom, you've got one question, have you? You've waited till the last. Yes. Uh, what about the fire rating of all these insulation materials? Yeah, good question, Tom. Um, materials that are that are certified to use as insulation in houses uh, is subject to Australian standards and has to be uh, fire safe. Um, that's not to say they can't burn, but they need to be able to uh, not sustain a flame if the source of combustion is removed. So in other words, if the house goes up, they might burn with everything else, but they they don't. Um, yeah, if 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 a, a typical test done on insulation is that um, if you put a blowtorch to it, it won't just go up in flames. So if you remove the source of uh, of ignition, it should self extinguish. Um, another way to answer that question is. Don't go putting um, improvised materials as insulation. Like if you find some sheets of polystyrene, don't go using it in your ceiling because it won't be treated with the fire retardant materials that, uh, that uh, building rated insulation polystyrene will. So, so in other words, not all insulating materials are, are equal. And ones that are, if you buy something that's certified for use in buildings in Australia, uh, it will be fire safe. Okay. Once again, thanks very much for that, Richard. Um, as I said, I'm sure everyone's appreciated uh, your talk. I think we've okay. learned a lot. Um, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, you say you go to people's houses, whether you uh, are available for consultation, uh, if anyone's interested in um, getting you around to their home. If, if, if so, if you could leave your contact details on the chat. Um, yeah, just, uh, just have a look at newenergythinking.com slash services. That gives an outline of how I work. Um, and, yeah, um, I'll, I'll just write that in the chat. So uh, thanks very much. Um, I'll, um, after this meeting, I'll go and um, explain all that to my wife and we'll just get under a thicker rug to keep warm rather than using our gas uh, heating. So thanks yes. very much, Richard. Okay. Bye, guys. See you. Um, it's now 8.29. I think if we have six-minute break, which will be 8.35, um, and we'll come back, um, there'll be some entertainment uh in the interlude and we'll uh, have the eye help men at 8 35 so we'll all have a break thanks okay it's uh 8 36 uh, we're all you're all back fully refreshed um uh, hopefully um i've got a message from rod jones said that the uh link that uh, was pasted uh, doesn't work um 
I've copied it, but I haven't tried it. So, um, Rob, I don't know whether you've got the contact details for our speaker that you can... Yeah, I'll, I'll follow it up, Peter. Thank you. Maybe next month or something. That, um, now, um, I'm not too sure who our I help man is. Are you going to be the I help man tonight, Bert? I'll have to unmute. Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, Bert. Um, Thank you. And all your queries answered, um, you, you can reciprocate and solve everyone's problems. So over to you. Uh, I don't think that was the only idea because <laughs> I think I'll need the help of uh, other I help uh, I helpers uh, to to answer all these questions. But anyway, I was just going to give you a little talk about I help, how it's going, and other some other facts that are interesting. Uh, some of the, the committee know that uh, uh, Harry does a report of the number of calls we take, etc., at iHelp. Uh, I guess most people are familiar with iHelp. We take all the calls between, officially between 10, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. of all our members to help them with their problems and issues with their computers. And uh, a lot of it is is well outside those hours as well. So, but anyway, this is basically what we do. And uh, so from since the beginning of the year, we've had 588 jobs. So it's, it's quite a few. And uh, a lot of them are done by many of the other members. I, I, I'm not as clever as a lot of them, but uh, I'll, I'll do, you know, several on my shift. We all take turns uh, different times. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. Uh, a lot of our members are, who are in their later years, even later than the average for the members here, uh, and they they have issues with uh, you know that they need help with. A lot of them are very basic in their usage of computers, so uh, it's uh, it's great to be able to help them. So out of those 588 jobs in since May. Uh, Harry has po posted these figures. Uh, there's been around half of those 588 jobs were done between May and up to August the 15th. Um, and uh, there's a total of uh, 100 and well, about 200 members involved in, uh, in, in, in being helped. So even though there's 588 jobs, quite often particular members need help several times over that period of time. Um, one of the other things that, that we, we got involved with was the transfer of all the uh, email addresses to, to Google from Microsoft and now as well to move anyone who has who is using the uh, MS365 uh, 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 storage um, to transfer them to the Google, uh, which is called Drive. We refer to it as Google Drive, and as Harry told me, it's, it's just Drive as far as Google are concerned. Anyway, it's much smaller than the what was available on MS365, which if you've still got MS365, you can still use that. But for those that were using MS365 through Melbourne PC, uh, you'll have to change any uh, drive memory that you're, you're, that you're saving uh, to Google. And uh, uh, they need to do that fairly soon I think the cutoff is is probably at the end of this month and uh, so you need to move your, your any anything you've got on on the MS365 uh, memory to uh, to Google Drive um, okay so that's that's a brief part of that I thought you might be just interested that, uh, just from my own experience I've been helping this particular uh 
member of Melbourne PC. He's 97 years old. <laughs> he's, uh, he's quite amazing. He, he lives not far from where I live in Ringwood. I'm in Blackburn. And uh, so I, I actually do a home visit there quite often to, to assist him, uh, mainly because we were helping him through things like uh, uh, Quick Assist or Team Viewer, but uh, it, it, even that's getting a little bit difficult for him now. But he, he, he's a fantastic guy. He, he really is. He's, uh, he's very appreciative of every bit of help he gets. And uh, most of his problems are because he's got detached retinas. He's had, uh, uh, you know, his eyesight's getting to be very bad. Uh, and he's, uh, he's got uh, quite, what, what's it called? Uh, yeah, I can't remember what it was called now. Uh, someone else might know what it is, but he, uh, he's got hearing aids in both ears. Plus he's got, um, you know, the T, the T, T circuit on, on his TV and things like that. And I tried to set that up on his computer, uh, and with some limited success, I was actually very surprised that he gets his hearing aid from a particular company and they haven't sort of really assisted him with all the things that he could do, which would make it so much easier for him to hear through his hearing aids. But anyway, that's, that's how it is. So we've tried to help him as well. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so we've had to change and, and the only way I can assist him now is to actually go and visit him, but he's only about, you know, six or seven minutes drive away. So I probably, go there on average once every couple of weeks sometimes it's twice in one week but other times it's quite a few weeks depending on his issues but that's the sort of people you know just to give you an example of uh of what we help we've got a few other very famous people within our group who uh i won't name them but uh they 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 are regular callers like they are weekly or twice weekly and almost daily uh requesting support and, and most of it is is just they're getting very aged and and find things difficult so anyway that's just a very brief sort of explanation of i help and what we do uh so i'll uh, i'll open it to questions with the help of uh, some of our other members that are attending at the moment so if anyone's got any questions, just use the uh, raised hand in reactions and hopefully we'll pick you up. John Thompsons. Hi, I've just had a curly one developed tonight. Um, a neighbour, I live in a retirement village and a neighbour came round. She's the secretary of one of the bodies on organisations in the village and her Windows 7 computer her laptop came with her and she said she can't log in, can't get the password up. Um, I've done a Windows uh, reset, uh, done all the repair operations. It, um, uh, oh. Anyway, it's, it's a reasonably old computer, but seem to be unable to use the keyboard once Windows boots. It can use it in um, the BIOS settings. I've been through all the BIOS settings and done all the all the usual tricks there, run mm -hmm. the diagnostics um, for the computer. Anybody got any hints and tips there? I thought the next thing I would try would be to use a USB keyboard on it and see if that makes any difference. But it seems to be the keyboard works. There's not a there's not a broken connection or anything there. It just doesn't work with Windows. So she can't answer the can't answer the password and stuck there. Mm. Anybody with suggestions? Uh, have you tried starting it in safe mode at all? John? Yep, tried that. Tried that. Wow. 
Yeah, I mean, I'd only sort of know the standard things. Uh, I don't know whether Harry or Stuart might have any suggestions. Sounds like it's missing a driver. Does it? Yeah. It's a matter of, How do matter you get of put in it, and, uh... putting it in without a keyboard. Yeah, that's the difficult <laughs> bit. So the mouse works all right, but just just the keyboard. Well, it's the touchpad. Yes, you so might the, have to so use the, the USB. There, there is a wired mouse, but I disconnected it and used the uh, keyboard, the touchboard, touchpad, touchpad, no, I should say. It's still no luck. No. You might have I'd to use the USB keyboard. Keyboard, John. You, I'd certainly suggest an external keyboard would be your next move. The yeah. USB keyboard, and see if you can isolate the problem that way. Yeah. I've done the yeah. same with my own laptop here at the moment. Uh, after we uh, spilt some wine on the laptop, <laughs> the keyboard doesn't work properly. Is she a oh, wine uh, drinker? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, John, I'm no expert, but uh, years ago I did use the on screen keyboard. I'm not sure whether that's a yeah, but you can't you can't get to it. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting problem. I've been yeah, Googling, have to... Googling it, and that's one of the answers that came up. Use the on-screen keyboard, but it's not the, it's not a keyboard wiring problem. It's a Windows not recognizing the keyboard. The BIOS yeah. is recognizing it. Windows not. What you about? said that you tried a, a, a USB, an external keyboard, separate keyboard, and it didn't, didn't I haven't work yet. I only got the thing about half past six. All right. But you've already tried that. Yeah. All right. Not not to worry. The other thing's a boot up from, uh, yes, from. Uh, oh, yes. Peter, Peter Carpenter's got emergency. something to say. What about removing the okay. human interface, interface device from the device manager? Yeah, but I can't get into it. But you can, with How? the mouse, use the file manager and find the... Um... How do I get to file manager? Well, I can't, I can't start Windows. You can't start Windows. Oh, I can't get past can't the get password. Past, can't get into, into Windows. Oh, I see. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that is an interesting problem. Yep. As Dave said, what, um, USB external keyboard. Yeah, yeah. But that All doesn't right. work. Didn't work either. Mm. Nope. Right. <sighs> okay, I'll go back to the drawing board. Yeah, it'll be a matter of just trying every single thing that's imaginable. PS2 keyboard, John. No, they're hardware, not software. Uh, PS2 doesn't plug into the laptop. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, it's got to be USB or, or wireless, and then even for wireless, I need a USB. I think you yeah. can get an adapter. Say that again. I think you can get an adapter for uh, uh, it'll it'll be um, PST. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to PST to USB. PST to USB. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, would wouldn't that just make it electronic again rather than? Yeah. Mm. Is there any advantage over using a USB electric yeah. uh, keyboard then? Well, I, I suspect Bert is right because you're only. It's not a converting it back. It's not a physical connection, is it? Right. Yeah. But is a PS2 keyboard actually different to a USB keyboard? Yep, substantially. All oh, right. Okay. Because it's hardware. Everything is wired. And no, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. But then, I could use. A PS2 keyboard with a PS2 to USB adapter no. into the laptop. But no. it, is that any different to using a, a USB keyboard? Yes, a PS2 keyboard in a PS2 socket is directly wired. Can't do, can't I, do I that. I know you can't do it. I know you can't do it. On the laptop. No, I'm just ans answering your question about PS2 keyboards. Mm. Yeah. I love them because they always work. <laughs> okay. Next question. You could um, take the laptop keyboard apart 
uh, John, and uh, re uh, reseat the ribbon cable underneath. It's not yeah, the but keyboard. It doesn't be seem to be the problem. It's not because, the keyboard yeah. because the keyboard works when I use the boot up. Yeah, when I use the um, the uh, diagnostics. Okay. And yeah. and the uh, uh, BIOS settings. I've been through all of those and checked them, changed okay. the boot order and all sorts. Richard Purdy's got his hand up, whether he has a, an answer to your problem or he may have a question. Now I have a, a, a uh, suggestion to get in, go into the BIOS, change the boot device. Yep. Uh, make it a bootable USB that's got a diagnostic program, and I can't think of the name, there's several around. Mm. And that will enable you to look at the setup in the Windows. Yeah, I, I thought of using thought of using a Windows on the go USB stick. Right, no go. Well, I haven't got round to it yet. Oh, okay, yeah. Hiring a boot CD might be a useful tool as well, John. Which Hiram's boot CD? Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that was one of the ones I was thinking of. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Got a few suggestions. Any other questions for our problem solvers? Frank? Yep, could I, could I um, throw my <coughs> current situation in? Uh, at the recent reloading or uploading of um, uh, Thunderbird, which I prefer to use <coughs> compared to a Google, uh, all of a sudden, I can't access my emails. Now, if I go to Google, and I, I've got no problems at all, I can read all the emails. But when I go to, th when I use my preferred, what John does, preferred uh, Thunderbird, it just looks for it, and just nothing happens. Now, were, were there some changes in the recent uh, uh, up up? scale or updating of Thunderbird. I'm just looking for the uh, notes that I took. Uh, so I was just wondering whether there's been some uh, mm. some major changes. Here we go. I get the, uh, the message, fail to connect the server, imap.gmail.com. And that's it. Yeah, I'm getting that quite frequently, but that's, I think it's a timing thing. And a couple of minutes later, everything's all right. Ooh. I, I suspect it's an update, a problem with the latest update. What version are you running? Hang on, I'll just have a look. I've got 102.2, <coughs> oh, sorry, 91. So oh, it says updates. I'm not up to date, no wonder. <laughs> don't, don't update. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> You have his problem. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, well, it's on its way anyway. Heck, you wouldn't be using AVG, would you, as well? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I came across a member during the week who had Thunderbird and AVG. And AV, with the email protection, AVG email protection won't allow authentication to proceed. So you have to turn it off to authenticate. Mm. <laughs> oh, well, I've just updated and I've just got an authentic authentic authentication failure while connecting to the server. So, okay, my, I, my, I put it down to our server being a bit slow. I, my version that uh, Thunderbird updated to is 102.2.1. Yeah, that's, that's what mine's just gone up to. Now, I've just logged on, and my last download was on the 30th of August. Hmm. Now, as a matter of interest, on the top left-hand side, where you get your inbox, and the dot just goes left, right, left, right, nothing happens. Uh, get new messages, and it just hangs. 
Can I make a suggestion? It's a few weeks back, but um, Gmail uh, required you to change the authentication meeting settings under your security settings in Thunderbird. Um, you have oh, to, sure. I can't remember exactly, but if you go into the security settings and look at authentication settings, then uh, at, a, yeah. at the Gmail end, but this is a few weeks ago. At, at the Gmail end, uh -huh. uh, they now couldn't take the the standard authentication setting. I'll I'll have a look at that as well. Um, excuse me. Like down down the bottom, it's it's got uh, my email address, and it goes on to say it tells me it's connected to imap.gmail.com. So something's happening, but it's not happening. Frank, there was recently a case where somebody had a similar problem to yours, uh -huh. and it was solved completely by switching off your modem for a, leave it off for about 30 seconds, switch back on again. And sometimes that works very effectively, Ooh. As, as it did for this member. But don't do it till the end of this Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that I will say goodbye now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll I'll try the authentication in Gmail number one, and then the uh, switch off in num as number two, and also AVG. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. Um, Just to elaborate on what I said a minute ago, in authentication method on, in security settings. Normal pass Gmail won't accept normal password any longer. So you scroll down to um, some other authentication method. O or auth two or something like that worked for me. But that that was a thing that came through from Gmail. Um, but as I say, it requires a change in the Thunderbird settings. Hmm. All right. Gives me something to do afterwards. Richard, off you go. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yes, I know. I don't use. I use uh, Thunderbird with Gmail, but not. But it's my own Gmail, and I did notice a change in settings where I had to. Uh, it, it didn't accept it, and it just. I deleted the account settings, and it it uh, sorted it out itself by recognizing all the settings. Uh, again, with the same. Um, port uh, that was 64 and 993 so it all happened all sort of automatically once i deleted the existing um, account settings but i suggest before you do that you might back that up with moz backup which is a thunderbird backup in case uh, you lose everything so um that's one suggestion well okay thank you Is Moz backup still working, Richard? Absolutely. I back it up with uh, uh, Thunderbird and with um, Firefox all the time. Okay. And uh, and I have a very, and I archive all my emails, so I have a very large uh, Thunderbird, uh, well, uh, about two gigabytes of emails going back from when. Right. Okay. I hadn't become out of date. But no, no, it's, it's, it hasn't changed at all, but it still works. Good to hear. Thanks. Sorry, which, which backup was it? You Moz, M-O-Z, uh, M-O-Z backup. Thank you. Yeah, M-O-Z, B-A-C-K-U-P, all one word. Thank you. I've been using uh, Mail Store Home, which works with uh, Outlook, but yeah, so, but I'm not very familiar with Thunderbird grouping that. I don't know, does anyone else use Mail Store Home? Is it? I'm nope. very lucky to have that actually because I lost a whole lot of emails. Yeah, Mail Store Home. Just one odd question about um, Google. 
it's, it's uh, asked me for my passport and driver's license the other day because uh, it didn't recognize me as being over 18 years of age. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't logged on on YouTube. <laughs> Anyone else come across that problem? I'm not prepared oh, to I've, give Google my I've, I've never, my never had to do that with Google. No. Oh, you'd want to check to make sure that is Google. It sounds like a scam mm. to me. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. It was directly on the YouTube interface. YouTube interface? Yes. It, could, it couldn't show me a certain video because I you know, didn't know I was over 18 years of age. Maybe there was <laughs> swear words or something. You take it as a compliment. <laughs> Uh, just a little bit more on my uh, keyboard problem. I've just been Googling as we go and uh, found one reference that said, press the Windows key and then the L key, L for lock or login. So uh, I'll try that after we finish this session. At what point is that, John? Pardon? At what point is that? At what point is what? When we finish this? <laughs> no, when you when you press the uh, Windows well, it lock. says how to lock and unlock your keyboard. Okay, mm. so the implication is that somehow the the lady who owns the laptop has managed to lock her keyboard, which yeah, might be the case. That's a possibility, and I guess it. Yeah. No, no, that's that's just um, switch user. No, that's... no, no. It is. It is. I mean, if you were to try it now, it would work. But you give me you've, a couple of minutes, I'll for, I'll try it. It's on another. See you computer. later. You've been saying that you've got no Windows keyboard control, correct? One mouse get the owl. We'll know talking. shortly. He'll come back. Not enough to try it. We're all going to have to wait with bated breath to see whether it works. <laughs> His problem was that they couldn't log in because yeah. there was no way of putting the password, password in. Yeah. Yes. Because the keyboard apparently wasn't working. Maybe exactly. the keyboard lock will only the work. Win L might work, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'm a bit dubious. <laughs> Never know your luck. No, it's, it's just a shortcut for switch user that comes up from the, uh, the left-hand menu. No, it's not so much switch user. It's, it's to um, lock the screen, basically, to, to put you back into, um, so you have to log in again. It's the same thing. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't but close it's a your programs. Thing. It doesn't close your programs. It just logs you out without yes. closing your programs. So it's, it calls itself... Okay. What it's worth, I just tried it before logging into my laptop and it just didn't have any effect. This is what I'd expect because the Windows key wasn't presumably active until I was in Windows. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And if I typed an L, it would have been taken to be part of my password. Mm. Well, I might have to leave you gentlemen in a few minutes. Uh, are you it's waving it's... goodbye, Tom, or you, <laughs> you needed attention? I'm, I'm waving goodbye. Thanks, Peter. Thank Thanks you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> See quite uh, a few of you tomorrow night at the East Zoom session. I... Yeah. I'm back uh, and it doesn't work. Away with the no, he's back. It doesn't work. Yeah. Keyboard still isolated. All right. Second last comment directed at you in the chat, David. I'll try Moz a backup for my Thunderbird and I'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, it's uh, five past uh, six minutes past nine. We might terminate the formal part of the meeting. Uh, now and we can stop recording. Um, I gather we'll leave the Zoom open for a few minutes more if anyone wishes to have an informal chat. Otherwise, we'll see you all in um, 
October. So good night.